welcome to all of you again uh, to our second night of our seminar. We want to thank you, thank uh, Pastor Daniel for working so hard. Uh, it's a uh, very you, rare that you, we can get someone like him to have three days of two hours seminar. We are very grateful uh, that he's able to do so, and we are blessed because of that. Uh, yesterday, he talked about crises, times of crises, and its impact and challenges to our leadership and to our understanding of leadership. And uh, he also given us some questions, and I trust that you will have time to ponder, to reflect, and think over the questions given by him yesterday. And I think that the questions are well worth thinking about uh, and reflecting about, as he will give us clarity in our own thinking about leadership. Tonight, he's going to talk about the nature of, of spiritual leadership in the first session and then the purpose of spiritual leadership in the second session. Okay, some housekeeping. Use your chat to ask your questions, but make sure that your questions are only on leadership. We don't have time to deal with other topics like family and, and other things, okay? Important though they may be. So make sure that the questions you ask are all on leadership. And then uh, finally, a uh, last appeal, turn on your video. We really want to see you and also like a security precaution. When we look at you and recognize you, then we know there are no hackers in our midst. Huh? So do us a favor and turn on your video so that you also uh, Pastor Daniel can see you and interact with you. This is a live session and the whole point of live session is for Pastor Daniel to interact with you. So without further ado, Pastor Daniel, all yours. Okay, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Tony Lim. Uh, welcome, friends, uh, to this session tonight. I understand a few new people join us tonight, so welcome you, all right, uh, for both tonight as well as tomorrow night, okay? Uh, why do we just commit this time to God in prayer? Our Father, we thank and praise you for your grace, goodness towards us, that we can come and share and learn together. Teach us, instruct us, our Father, we pray, oh God so that we we'll continue to discern your heart, your mind, and how we could be the kind of person and leader you want us to be. So help us, our Father, we pray, as we commit this time to you, O oh God, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're talking about times of crisis. We all know that, as I said a little bit yesterday, uh, crisis will bring up either the best in us or the worst in us. Okay, that's uh, the reality. Uh, sometimes it could be, which I did not mention yesterday, it could be a health crisis. See, some people, because of high health crisis, becomes very angry with God, very bitter against God, which is so sad, actually, you know. And so, therefore, how we handle it is so important for us. For other people who go through a health crisis, uh, came out a much better person, trusting God and believing God for whatever comes. The, even if no healing comes, the person will need to accept, okay, that this is, the grace, mercies, and the love of God upon him. So that's one area that comes out. Another area that can come out in terms of crisis, a relationship crisis, okay? Because uh, some people, because of uh, relationship uh, problems in church, would leave the church, who have, one, have nothing to do with the church, or sometimes could even be the church leader or a pastor, okay? And, uh, and uh, this is an area as well that God is teaching us how to handle uh, the kind of relationship crisis. Uh, it could also be an emotional crisis whereby we could be betrayed, okay? Uh, in uh, our business deals, in our friendship whatsoever. And so therefore, as a result, uh, we could end up, okay, a very angry person, all right? And, and so all these things, I think, God is teaching us and molding us to know how to respond because if we respond wrongly, we end up really uh, being gripped by it, being imprisoned and enslaved by it. And therefore, if we have this pain and wound in our heart, what happens is the past has imprisoned our present because pain is always to do something that's happened in the past. And so if we harbor this, the past has imprisoned our present and prevented us from living the future. And it's so sad that people who harbor this kind of thing, they, are, they don't realize they're actually living in the past, not even in the present, and certainly not into the future. And so we recognize that crisis can bring the best out of us. Sometimes if we're not careful, uh, the worst okay, out, of, out of us as well. And so last time we talked about uh, what will crisis do, and we look at some of the principles of spiritual leadership. 
okay, and what makes it different from uh, social, political, economic, or educational leadership. All right, now, tonight we can look at the nature of spiritual leadership. Then also we look at uh, the purpose and the practice of it, okay, uh, which is I trust important uh, for all of us. Okay, now uh, this uh, spiritual leadership is different in what way it is different okay for all of us all right firstly we find that there's an anointing okay on the person about spiritual leadership okay good example that i can think of is that of uh, uh, david actually okay we know that samuel was sent by god to specifically anoint david as uh, the new king of israel but you see, when Samuel was told to go, he was, I'm sure, panicking in his pants. Why? Because Saul was still in power as a king. How dare he okay, uh, go and do that? Right? But we find that God's instructions are so clear that uh, this is the record for us like this. And 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then left. To Rama. And so you notice here is an example of just God's anointing and grace upon uh, the spiritual leader's life. And that's what makes it different from secular forms of leadership, whereby there is the affirmation, the favor, and the grace of God upon uh, that person's life. Now, it does not mean, you see, friends, anointing does not mean that the person will not do wrong, that the spiritual leader under God's anointing unction will not do wrong. Right, that even a spiritual leader needs to be careful and watchful about how he or she uh, leads his or her life, and that's very, very important. See, sometimes this anointing could be misused in what manner and form. See, some people will say, Don't touch the Lord's anointed. Now, we can take this to extreme, and we need to be very careful about it. Okay, uh, now we know, of course, in the context of where it came from, was actually David. Uh, was pursued by Saul like crazy, okay? And David had an opportunity actually to kill Saul. And there at that point of time, right, David said, no, I will not touch the Lord's anointed, okay? In that kind of context, which is really an amazing mark of this young man uh, called David that God said that he eventually become king of Israel, okay? But you see, what happens is it does not mean that if we're anointed servant of the Lord, we will do no wrong. Okay, and this so accountability becomes very important. Humility becomes very important uh, for all of us. We cannot demand from people, I'm the Lord's anointed, you cannot touch them. I think we shouldn't do that. As I said last night, leadership is not one of domination and control. It's, it comes from a heart of servanthood uh, that's important. And even anointed leader must operate within a certain parameter, which is that of the Bible. And that's very important because others we can misuse. Okay, and uh, and uh, take this to extreme about the lost anointed. So I think we got to be very careful uh, about this because all of us, no matter how anointed we are, we still need to be accountable. There must still be the humility and teachability uh, about all of us. Okay, I think that's uh, that's important. A second uh, nature of spiritual leadership is that one carries spiritual authority. Okay, and. Uh, the context I'm thinking of is that of Prophet Nathan, actually, uh, who was sent by God to confront David. Uh, why? Because David has just committed adultery. And so when Nathan came to David, I thought like a very clever Malaysian cooked up a cock and bull story. Okay, went round and round and tell you an amazing story about this rich man. He has a visitor coming okay, to visit him. And this rich man wanted to give him a wonderful meal. Okay, but instead of taking from one of his flock, an animal from one of his flock, he looked around at this poor man there's only one ewe lamb, okay, and took hold of the ewe lamb uh, of, the, of, uh, of this poor man and uh, cooked it and offered it as a meal to this visitor of his that has come to visit him. And so when David heard about that story, okay, told by Nathan, David was fuming mad. Okay, who is that guy? Okay, I'm ready to give him trouble. Now, here is what Nathan now said to David. You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. 
I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all these had been too little, I would have given you even more. Okay? And why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife Uriah the Hittite uh, to be your own. So, we, we know the context was David's committed adultery okay, with Bathsheba. And, uh, and so Nathan was sent to confront uh, 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 David. Now, I think it's no joke ready to confront a king of those days. Because a king of those days, they, they play all three roles, both judge, jury, and executioner. So anyone coming to see the king in those days, okay, if that person is not careful, that person could be history. Because right, in the case, for example, of David, he could just flick his fingers and say, take him right, to one of his army officers, and Nathan could be history. And yet Nathan dares to come to confront David okay, about his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. Uh, never, never an easy thing. But friends, that's what it is at the heart of it. When a person carries spiritual authority, the person goes under the authority of God to dare to confront even very difficult situations, difficult people like this. You know, all right? And uh, that's what spiritual authority uh, is, really. But on the other hand, can I say, spiritual authority cannot be ordered or commanded. We cannot say to people, uh, because, okay, I have authority, you better submit to me, you better obey whatever I say. No, friends, you know, if a person has real spiritual authority, spiritual people can recognize it and would be willing to submit to people like that. But if we do not have spiritual authority, you can order people around. And spiritual authority, friends, can I say, it's got nothing to do with the degrees we have, the titles and awards we have got. Nothing to do with that. It is a person that we are. Okay, and that's very, very important. That if there's spiritual authority you carry, friends, can I say, spiritual people will recognize that and not only recognize that, they will, they will want to come and submit to your authority. You don't have to demand it, you don't have to ask for it. They will happily come to you and say, Could I hold myself accountable to you? Could, could you hold me accountable in a way I live my life? Uh, and friends, I think that's the right playing out the spiritual authority. And there's a reason why in the case of Nathan, right, as a prophet of God, he was unafraid uh, to even confront David because of authority he carries. And in that sense <coughs> also, David is so precious, really, in the eyes of God. Why? Because when confronted, David himself all right, repented from it. And Psalm 51, as we know, it's a some repentance of David about his adulterous relation with Bathsheba. Okay? And that's why David is really very much a man of the God's own heart. And that's the reason why also uh, you notice that David is uh, known as the greatest king that Israel has produced. To this very day, we go to Jerusalem. There's a King David's hotel uh, that is there. Uh, and David has always been revered as a king uh, by every Jewish person uh, really in this regard. But you see, when a person carries spiritual authority, uh, the person knows that at the end, he fears God more than he fears men. And that's very, very important uh, for all of us in spiritual leadership, right? That it should be one whereby we fear God more than we fear men. And that's why you notice, friends, uh, in 1 Peter, we are told to submit to authorities, isn't it? And the passage that Peter talks about to submit to authorities, you notice, okay, Peter said, we should fear God and honor the king. Okay, fear God and honor the king. Never fear the king and honor God. Okay, once we reverse it, we get it wrong, we're in trouble. And that's why sometimes, you know, living in, the, in this world that we are in, sometimes we fear men more than we fear God. Once you get that order wrong, no wonder we find that everything goes wrong in a process like this. You know? It should always be the other way around. We fear God, but we honor people. Okay, and that's what spiritual authority is all about. He or she fears God so much that would not give in to whatever challenge, whatever difficulty, whatever problem uh, may be confronted. Okay? And I think that's an important matter uh, for all of us in exercising spiritual leadership.
I think the third area of the nature of spiritual is one has intimacy with God. And here's an example of Moses in Exodus 33. All right, and in verse 11, it says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses returned to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. See, here's this man of God, Moses, able to commune with God face to face, amazing intimacy with God. Okay, and uh, that's what it is uh, for all of us, actually, uh, as we seek to want to grow in our spiritual leadership uh, role and responsibility. Right, that developing that close walk with God becomes very important uh, for all of us because when there's intimacy with God, we hear from, from God and we respond to what He will prompt, He will speak to us uh, in this regard here, okay, for all of us. And that's the other part about Joshua being so precious. See, after his seafood, so called Moses has left, see, Joshua will stay there. We will not leave the tent. He will spend time with God Himself. I believe, friends, you know. Joshua had a fantastic early start in his life, valuing the presence of God, treasuring the intimate walk with God. And no wonder God prepared him so well in the coming days. When Moses would leave the sin, Joshua stepped into the huge pair of shoes as he would really step into. Okay, because why? I believe he's well mentored by Moses and seeking the face of God that is very important for us. You see, even the whole year intimacy with God that we commune, we talk, we converse with God, okay? And God will speak to us. We must also understand that we don't hear from God correctly all the time, 100%. See, no matter how intimate our walk with God is, and this is where it teaches us about humility, okay? Because if we say, I hear from God correctly all the time and expect people to listen to everything I say, we are on actually dangerous grounds. And this is sometimes, you know, friends, I say to some intercessors as well, there are wonderful people, godless, really spiritual people, spend tons of time in prayer, that kind of thing. Right? And, uh, and it's great, and I value people, it's, I treasure, I journey with people like this for many years now, and I, I really treasure the friendship uh, and, and, and relationship. But sometimes, you know, as God has drawn us into this wonderful intimate walk with God. God will speak to us and increasingly we'll be able to exercise prophetic giftings, which is fantastic, right? And we release words uh, from the Lord to God's people, to leaders of the church, even to the pastor of the church. And sometimes when we release a word to the pastor of the church, we expect the pastor of the church to, to carry it out fully and totally, completely. And when sometimes the pastor is slow, we start putting pressure on. And there's another danger we can fall into, friends. That sometimes because of our intimate walk with God, if we're not careful, not it will happen, but if we're not careful, we can slowly, slowly become arrogant, actually, thinking that we hear from God correctly. Or nobody hears from God correctly. Only Jesus, unless we are Jesus, that's a different matter. And so even Moses, for example, he made mistakes. You know what I mean? That should keep us humble. And that's very important mark of spiritual leadership. Humility is an important quality that no matter how close we are with God, we got to recognize that sometimes we can still hear wrongly. All right, that will really keep us humble. Okay, and so, uh, but a spiritual leader enjoys his time with God, would want to spend time with God. It's important. Then the fourth area, uh, nature of spiritual leadership, is one whereby prayer is vital for the person. All right, a life of prayer. Uh, is something that a spiritual leader would desire and want to as well. Modeling after the life of Jesus. We notice in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Mark writes like this, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off the solitary place where he prayed. Imagine the Son of God himself would spend time with the Father like this, early in the morning while it was still dark. And then, Lifestyle of Jesus, we see here that Dr. Luke gives us a glimpse about, okay, that this is the normal lifestyle of Jesus, Luke 5, 16. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So it's a habit of Jesus. Again and again, he would quietly just put himself away uh, from the crowd and from whatever else, and we just spend time uh, with the Father, okay? Now, if Jesus, the Son of God, would do that kind of thing, 
I think it's a strong reminder to all of us uh, to do the same as well. That prayer should be a lifestyle uh, for us just more and more. Okay, that's important. In fact, I'm reminded very much by uh, Dr. Billy Graham. Okay, he said once, actually when there's a life, of course, he said, I wish I had preached less and pray more. I wish I preached less and pray more. I think many of us, including myself, would say this so much the same as well. Uh, I wish we preach less, talk less, and we pray more and spend time with God more and just enjoy His presence uh, and just have a wonderful conversation with Him. And so it's, an ex it's something we all learn. I'm learning, still learning, far, far from the fact that I'm a, a praying giant, as it were. We are all in a journey together. Uh, the, the wonderful thing is that we can journey together, okay, and allow others uh, to help us along. And this is where, friends, in a whole area of prayer, Right? We want to hang around people of prayer and people of faith. Very important. See, you want to grow in faith. I tell people, hang around people of faith. Don't hang around people of little faith or even people of no faith. Because hang around people of little or no faith. Whatever faith, you could be sucked dry by this kind of people like this. You know? So you want to grow in faith, hang around people of faith. You want to grow in prayer, hang around people of prayer. Because you find that you begin to bathe in the atmosphere that will really help us. To, to begin to own and decide the kind of heart of prayer, of intimate walk with God. Okay, and this is, uh, friends, so that in a process, we begin to hear God just better and better over time uh, by the grace of God. Uh, really. okay. I think the fifth area of the nature of spiritual leadership is that a spiritual stature, okay, about that person. Okay, reminds uh, me very much about the life of Jesus. This is what Luke writes for us. Uh, chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. A spiritual leader uh, will grow in stature, will continue to develop in that area. Now, what is this stature uh, that we talk about? Now, stature is not to, nothing to do with height or the, our size, okay? But it is basically one standing before God and before people, okay? It reflects our character. Uh, it reflects us as a person in our journey of faith in life and how far we've attained, as it were. Uh, inner stature grows slowly over time, okay? We don't become a personal stature overnight, uh, all right? And so I compared it to that of, uh, say, mushrooms. Mushrooms grow overnight, uh, but it also dies, okay, very quickly after that. Right? We are not growing mushrooms, we are growing oak trees. Oak trees, as we know, take a long, long time to grow. Okay? Uh, but we know that once it grows well and strong, it is able to stand whatever challenges, whatever pressure, whatever wind, whatever force it will come against it. Okay? And, and statues like this, when a person has a stature, the person carries a weight, as it were, a standing, a comportment about the person's life, so that uh, you'll find that people recognize Right, here's a man, okay, uh, that we will honor, we will respect uh, because of the stature. And so a spiritual leader uh, will increase and grow in stature. I pray by God's grace, we all together, all of us, okay, uh, by the grace of God and touched by God and come to know uh, faith in Jesus Christ. We will just uh, continue to grow, uh, develop and mature uh, uh, in, in, in this area, okay, for us. Then, sixthly, uh, unashamedly Christian, all right, a spiritual leader. And so Paul writes like this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 8. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. See, the apostle Paul here mentions very clearly, okay, twice in this regard, don't be ashamed to testify, don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner. Right. And I think this is an important uh, uh, mark and value uh, of a spiritual leader. One who is unashamedly Christian. One who is actually open about his faith or her faith. And I think it's one, one who doesn't hide his or her faith. I think that's very important uh, for all of us. So I tell people, for example, when you start work in a place of work, if you go for lunch, okay, with a colleague, uh, all right? If there's no pattern to give thanks uh, for the food, uh, bow your heads and just give thanks for the food, okay? 
in the presence of your friends, uh, even for the first time. Do that. Okay, very important. Uh, because we know, of course, the first time you do it is a very uh, frightening as it were. We get very nervous about it. My goodness, am I trying to show how spiritual I am? But if this is our normal pattern in life, I say do it. Or the first time we do it, it's always very scary, difficult. But friends, once you do it, you find that it becomes easier and easier because that's part and parcel of your habit and your lifestyle uh, for all of us. And so therefore, we should be unashamed actually to let people know that we are Christian. And I tell people as well, if you apply for a job, okay, after you study the company and everything about the company, you think there's a good company to work for, you go for the interview and everything else. And quite often at the end of the interview, the interview will ask you, is there anything you'd like to say or anything you'd like to ask? Uh, and I tell a lot of young people, I say one of the things that you should say is this, you know, that I appreciate the company. I just studied so many things about the company and I believe this is a great, great company. I, I want to work in and so on and so forth. That if I accept it, it'd be fantastic, it'd be wonderful. But also at the end, you say uh, to the person concerned, unashamedly, by the way, actually, if you don't mind uh, me saying, actually, I'm a Christian. Okay. And, uh, and you know, the values uh, that I've learned and developed over, over time as a Christian that I believe. Uh, would be so good for any company uh, that a Christian will work in, that I will work in, okay? And uh, and it can be assured that I give my level best if I'm, okay, taken by the company, uh, right? Because these Christian values, I believe, will contribute to the good of the company. But these are values I will live by and stand by as well. These are values that I will not compromise as well as a Christian honestly speaking. But you can be assured I will give my very best and I believe the Christian I can contribute uh, uh, to the company. I think we should be unashamed to say that. Okay, so that when the pressure sometimes comes upon you to say, the boss says, I want you to do this, and you know that's something unethical, you could then say to the boss, you know what, boss, I told you at the interview, I'm a Christian. All right, there are certain values that I practice that I cannot compromise. If you don't mind me saying that, very frankly, very honestly. Okay, and this is where. It, when we are unashamedly Christian, honestly speaking, from day one, it gives us, honestly speaking, okay, the foundation as well as the basis, okay, character for us to stand firm in this regard. And that is very important for us so that we don't compromise the values of the kingdom, right, in living our faith wherever we are. Uh, okay, likewise, if you're a boss of a company, you should be unashamed to let everybody know. Uh, everybody knows that you're a Christian, okay? Uh, and you just live it out like this. You know, I think of uh, many will probably know uh, Far East Organization Singapore, Mr. Philip, mm, okay? A very fine Christian. He's unashamedly Christian, and you say so. And I heard him several times that you would just take the Bible and speak to his staff team, senior manager. You would just take the Bible and speak off just like that. <laughs> and so, uh, but you see, it is not just he is trying to impress people, but that's how he lives his life as well. He's one of the humblest persons that I know of myself, personally, actually. You know? And so therefore, we should be unashamedly Christian, but by our practice, I think it's very important we reflect what it is all about uh, uh, as a Christian. I think that's, uh, that's very, very... We're not out to impress people. We're out to live our faith, okay? But we should be unashamedly Christian uh, for us in this regard. Then, number seven, there is inner strength in such a person. All right? Uh, and so, uh, Paul writes like this. Uh, sorry, uh, Luke writes like this in Acts 20, verses 23 and 24, about what Paul says. Because Paul was warned, okay, that if you go to Jerusalem, you will be, you will be in big, big trouble. Okay? And this is how, even though warned by this uh, prophet called Agabus, this is Apostle Paul's uh, response. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. You see, friends, in spite of fact, Paul has been warned, you'll be in big trouble if you go. You will suffer persecution. You might even die in the process. Paul says, sorry, no, 
I'm going to press on. I'm going to finish the race and complete the task that God has given to me. Uh, why is it like this? Because in the case of a spiritual leader, there's an inner strength. There's an inner resilience as well as resolve to want to fulfill God's call upon his life or her life. And I think that's an important mark of spiritual leadership okay, for, uh, for us uh, and our role that we're supposed to be playing as well. Okay, that at the end, of course, we know our strength comes from God. It's not by our strength. Okay, it's not by our ability. But we submit ourselves to God and say, Lord, you help me. You lead, you guide me. I want to fulfill what you have called me to. Okay, and uh, God, give me the strength. And he will, uh, really, because he wants to come alongside, so strengthen us, support us, enable us, fulfill our responsibility uh, as, a, uh, as a spiritual leader. Okay, and so this is what we see uh, in the life of Apostle Paul, so that when there is inner strength, we find we don't simply give in or give up. Uh, any challenge we face, we don't just give up like that. We would just want to press on, okay, and, and hang in there and trust God for His grace to sustain uh, us true for us. Okay. Then number eight, uh, it offers hope to people. I think it's a very important area for us in our responsibility wherever we are even for you in your place of work, all right? And for those of us right now with this pandemic happening uh, in our business, uh, in, our, in whatever we go through, I think it's very important we must offer hope to people around us and not just hope in our hope with us ourselves in the Lord, but also offering others around us, even non-Christians hope. A good example I think of is Apostle Paul. They're on a journey to Rome. We all know, all right? They almost all died, okay? Uh, they almost want, all want to give up. But he was Apostle Paul in the midst of despair, in the midst of helplessness, if not hopelessness. Here is Paul stepping in and said the following, okay, to the people present in the boat. And so let me read Acts 27, verses 21 to 25. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the sheep will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, whose I am, of whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, man. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. You see, it's just as amazing. Apostle Paul, all right, uh, of course, because of his walk with God, because as a spiritual leader, in spite of the fact that the huge majority on board the ship, they're not Christians. Only Paul and his companions, people like Luke, were on board the ship. Okay? But most are not Christians. Some there are 276 of them. And yet, Paul, in the midst of a situation of hopelessness, as it were, Paul steps in and offers them hope. And I believe, friends, you know what? This is what a spiritual leader ought to be doing or in the exercise of our spiritual leadership. That in a situation where in which you be offering hope. But right now, friends, I think of the pandemic. People are fearful. People have a sense of despair. Some uh, could be even depressed right now. Look at the situation, the situation ahead. Some are gripped by fear. What does the future hold for me? Uh, some might even contemplate more serious things like suicidal thoughts, okay? All right, thinking that the best way to end my life like this. See, friends, this is where at this point of time, in the time of crisis, you and I, who are people of hope, must offer hope to people around us, must journey with them. And I think that's so, so important for all of us. In fact, this is one big challenge that we're going to face arising from this pandemic. Okay, and what is that? There's going to be increase of social, emotional, and mental problems. Okay, and I was so glad to hear the other day, uh, Dr. T. Manyam uh, from your church, uh, Dr. Tony Lim. Yes. Uh, he gave a fantastic talk on whole year mental health. I listened to it on YouTube. I was really blessed by it. But I was already working on this early on, okay, since the start of MCO, because we're all under lockdown, okay, isolated and lonely for some of us. And we find that some of us, as a result of that, can feel so isolated if 
uh, in despair and sense of helplessness, even hopelessness, sometimes if you're not careful. And friends, can you see, there are many non-Christians. They are really living. Okay. In fact, I remember watching a video on the third day of MCO here in Malaysia. Right? This uh, uh, senior Chinese man called up the police station and talk, and tell the policeman in Bahasa, in Malay, okay, uh, I, I'm so lonely, I'm so tired, I'm so weary, could you please come and arrest me, okay, just take me, to, I want to get out of my house, I couldn't, I couldn't stand anymore, staying at home, all right, could you just come and arrest me, take me out of the house like this, and this, that's what happens, so some people sometimes, you know, out of, of isolation and loneliness and therefore despair, okay, they would just, uh, just, uh, just respond in very weird manner. And I believe, friends, you know, this is not just with the world outside. It could happen with Christians. And that's why my appeal to some people, some pastors I've spoken to, you know what? Because of the increase of social, emotional, and mental problems, we must begin to train ourselves with a new challenge. How to counsel people like this? So some of us, I say, you know, to so begin to explore in our churches to offer biblical counseling to journey with these people, to help them, all right, to have breakthroughs in a process by the grace of God, we pray. But that's a reality, offering hope uh, for the many around us. And more so for non-Christians, when they look at the world like this and what is to come, they are really gripped by fear. There's so much uncertainty as to what is to come, and friends. And so this is where we can play a critical role, not because of us, but because of Jesus and the gospel of hope you and I can offer to them. Okay, and that's very important uh, for us. Then the ninth area is a willingness to suffer for Jesus. We're needful. Okay, that's important. And so Acts 20, verse 23, uh, Paul says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Okay, uh, that's Paul's testimony. And then also, uh, Apostle Peter writes this in 1 Peter in the context of persecution, Okay, carried out by Emperor Nero, unfortunately. Uh, Peter says this, 1 Peter 4 and verse 15. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a madman. In us, friends, you know, we should not be suffering foolishly or unnecessarily. Right? Uh, if someone comes up to me and says, hey, hey, Daniel, is there anything I can suffer for you? Okay, I'm going to send this guy to the mental hospital to have an examination of it of his brain to say, of his mind to say, where something has gone wrong, okay? Now, we shouldn't be looking for suffering or, or even unnecessarily courting suffering by purposely, you know, doing things that are wrong, uh, doing things that will create, okay, uh, a, a clash of personalities and therefore, as a result in the process, we suffer. No, no, we shouldn't be looking for sufferings or suffering unnecessarily or suffering foolishly, as uh, Peter here tells us. But if there's a need to take a stand all right, for the Lord Jesus Christ, take a stand in terms of being consistent with your Christian values and be suffering. So we just have to trust God, okay, and allow God's grace to just break through in our lives and press on to fulfill what is his, uh, his plan, his purpose, his call is for all of us. Okay, uh, but a Christian, whilst we, do not, we don't look for suffering, a Christian, I think, must be prepared for it if it comes and when it comes. Okay. And Jesus has warned us many times about this, that if anyone will follow after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For he who loves his life will lose it, but he who loses life for me in the gospel's sake will gain it. And so Jesus makes it very clear, likewise, in following him, that is, he is not saying we will definitely suffer. That is the possibility. All right. Uh, living this world that we are in like this. And so therefore, in a case of a spiritual leader, a spiritual leader, is not uh, fearful, not afraid of the suffering if it has to come. But he or she will not look for suffering unnecessarily or even courting suffering sometimes foolishly. Uh, no, we shouldn't do that. There's nothing good that will come up from it at all. Okay, But we know that if you're faithful to the Lord, unfortunately, sometimes we have the faces in our place of work, uh, Okay, in, uh, in our home sometimes we find that our loved ones are upset with us because we've become a Christian. And there's many other factors uh, involved in it, okay, like that. But uh, that's something that we have to trust God and be faithful uh, about it in this regard. All right, that's so much I want to say about the nature of uh, spiritual leadership, all right? 
And I've got actually a question here for again for you to reflect. Now, I forgot to say early on that I trust uh, you get these notes printed beforehand. Uh, look, look through, think about it, okay? Uh, and then uh, you have you may have come up with other questions we could talk in track as well. But this is for your own thinking, for your own reflection, uh, your own work. I think uh, maybe sometimes two or three or four could gather together to discuss some of these things and its implication for your life, your responsibility, your leadership, whatever else, and whatever role that you play. Okay. And so my question is, is why is a character of spiritual leadership fundamentally different from all the other forms of leadership in the world? Why is this important? What gives spiritual leadership unusual power and authority? Okay, and this is all connected uh, with the nature of spiritual leadership, as well as yesterday I talked about the principle of spiritual leadership. If you combine the two together, you begin to see that uh, spiritual leadership is so different from that of the world that as a result, friends, if we really were to carry out uh, this role of a spiritual leader in a manner that is consistent with scripture and will honor God, we find that our influence impact is huge, enormous, actually. And that's the reason I said, okay, last time, that spiritual leadership is the most difficult, most demanding, but also most powerful. Because God is at the heart of it all, uh, in our responsibility and the role that we play as a spiritual. And if God is behind it, that we seek to honor God, live up for God and His values. I think there's God's hand in affirmation upon our lives. And this we can trust, okay? Uh, to press on, if you will, not in an arrogant, in a problem, but in a humble, servant heart and attitude man that we press on to fulfill God's plan and God's purpose for us in our lives. Okay, I want to stop here, maybe uh, pause for this point of time and may throw it open for uh, questions if there is. There's a question here Does spiritual mm. leadership applies to political leaders? Uh, yes, it can apply, actually. Uh, if that political leader is a Christian, okay, and the desires to really honor God, of course. A, a fantastic example I think of is Abraham Kuyper. So Abraham Kuyper is a Dutchman, all right? Uh, he was a theologian before he became Prime Minister of Holland, all right? And amazing leadership he exercised in Holland. Today, if you know, Free University Amsterdam was actually started by him, all right, with this understanding of theology and everything else and weave together. And Free University, of course, today has gone really liberal now. But when he started, it was a brilliant idea from Abraham Kuyper, actually. Right? And how he weaves his, uh, his political thinking with his spirituality and his understanding of scripture and of theology together. And so, he played a fantastic part and a role, actually, uh, in that regard. Okay, like that. So it's all possible, actually. In fact, for that matter, in any form of leadership, you can be leading uh, your business uh, and can be a spiritual leader because of your faith in Christ and you seek to grow increasingly uh, in your spiritual understanding, your, your, your maturity, your stature, your, your, your depth of scripture and how you, it works it through. And you find it eventually, uh, you carry the kind of anointing and grace of God upon your life in a leadership company. Now, not that when you're a spiritual leader, there'll be no problems. In fact, sometimes, you know what, when you're a spiritual leader, there may be more problems that you'll face. Okay, for example, yeah, since I'm talking about is a political leader who could be a spiritual leader. See, if you are a political leader of a country, you're also a real spiritual person. Uh, there are actually many challenges you'll face. Like, for example, okay, if you're hating the government, would you allow Empat uh, Nombo, four digit, okay, to run in a country? Would you allow horse racing to run okay, in a country? All right? Because you know all these are all involved in gambling, would you? So it doesn't make you actually easier. It will pose uh, certain challenges, even new challenges, but it is not insolvable. Okay, but I don't want to go into it. I can talk about it, but I won't go into it. So it's possible to be a political leader a commercial leader, a social leader, and a real spiritual person. I think that, that will be an excellent combination, okay, uh, I think. Okay, we can talk about it, okay, uh, all right, the platform. But I think what is important is if you, if you play that role, then you need to have uh, some spiritual counselors who will journey with you. If the person is wise, because by ourselves, no matter how spiritual we are, 
we need people to help us to journey with us, including for us as pastors, I said, we all need, okay, uh, people who journey with us, people who have the same heart and mind about God and the things of God, to change for our own good, and we all need that, and more so political leaders, business leaders. And so this man I talked to, Mr. Philip, for example, he's got a chaplain in this company full time, okay, I, and I know him well as well, and so what a joy to see him there as an employee, praying, uh, counseling, making available, and chapel uh, once a week, every week, uh, it's on like this, and it's open to all, anyone can come for it. Yeah, one of the most formidable verses in the Bible is touch not the Lord's anointed. But uh, so how do we disagree and even disobey spiritual leadership? Uh, well, well, the Reverend Dr. Tony Lim, please help us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, as I said earlier on, you see, the touch, not the Lord's anointed, can be taken to extreme. And the danger is this, sometimes I find for people who use that, uh, it means I can do anything I like and I want, and nobody can touch me. I mean, there's no such thing. Uh, I don't believe that. If the person says, that's why I say, you can take that to a real extreme, as I said earlier on in my teaching, right? And a few of these actually take to the extreme that I know of. Right? Because I'm Lord's anointed, you cannot touch me. I think there's a, a abuse and misuse of scripture. Uh, okay? And a wrong understanding of what the Lord's anointed is. Because for all of us, no matter how spiritual we are, there is a parameter we must all operate by, which must be consistent with scripture. So if our life and our lifestyle is not consistent with scripture, we actually lose a spiritual authority to lead anymore, actually. Because why? We've gone out, we've fallen out of the guard rails. Okay? And so therefore, no matter how anointed we are the servant of God, all of us needs accountability, all of us needs submission, humility uh, to one another, which is, I think, very important uh, for us. Uh, but if people see that you are an anointed servant of God who lives by scripture and seeks to own, obey the Lord and serve him with all heart, people can see and recognize that. And people will love you like crazy, as anointed servant of God. But you know, uh, but you can, as I say, go to that extreme of demanding people to say, nobody can touch me. When we are consistently doing things that are against scripture, then I think we have lost actually that right. Would you counsel such members of such dysfunctional leadership to leave the church or to confront and change the, the leadership? I think what happens, we need to sit down with the person concerned to work things through, okay? And so uh, probably two or three people need to sit down and work through with that person concerned, uh, okay? But because before going pray like crazy first as always, okay? And secondly, that God's presence will really be there and that, uh, okay, that the person concerned would have the humility and the grace to listen and to submit. And that's very, very important. But we don't go there uh, with a judgmental attitude. All right? I think that's very important. We must not go there with a self-righteous attitude to say, I'm right, you are wrong. No, no, no. I think we go with attitude of wanting reconciliation, wanting the best of one another. Okay, if we come, I think, with that kind of attitude, wanting the best of one another, and what is good for the body of Christ, what is good for you, what is good for us, and what is good for the work of God. I think we come with the attitude of wanting Okay, reconciliation and moving together to continue on the work of God that He's given to us. I think I think it's great. It's not so trying to press a person down and, and say, tell them your users, your lousy, you're under judgment for. I think we shouldn't come to that kind of judgmental attitude as well. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a comment and question here. The comment is that um, most of us in this seminar are over 40s and apparently the millennials, the younger people are lukewarm nowadays. So how do we encourage the younger people to take on the mantle of leadership? Okay, wow. That's a great question. I like that question. You know what? Very simple. Every one of you above 40, take one younger person along and join with that person. Yeah, seriously. All right. Can I say to all of you listening in, all right. if you're above 40, you don't have to be above 40, whatever age you are, can I, can I urge you, encourage you, everyone of you take a younger person along. 
all right, and journey with that person. Be available to that person, okay, and help that person, encourage that person, pray with that person, and meet as often as possible with that person. All right, it's like you trying to disciple that person. You like a father to that person. That is, and in fact, honestly, uh, this raises the other, the other point which I want to say, uh, but I better say it here since it comes up. I pray that God raise up many fathers of faith to younger people. All right, that's my prayer, honestly. It's like what Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, all right, to the Corinthians. You have 10,000 guardians in Christ, but you do not, do not have any father. I'm your father in Christ. And, and so I'm praying very much that, Lord, you raise up many more fathers of faith, as it were, to genuine younger people and raise them out, okay, as sons and daughters uh, in our discipleship together. Okay, and so uh, we don't have to be very, very mature to do that. Any one of us with a few years of experience as a Christian can take a younger person or, and just join with that person. You know? And so really, this is, this, is, uh, this is my heart's appeal to all of you, everyone you're listening in. I hope you'll take a younger person on, all right, and join with that person. Because friends, can I say, many young people are crying, crying for someone who could help them along. Uh, and that's the best way to prevent it from backsliding. All right, and be available to them. Uh, friends, can I say, not just for a season of time, available to, if possible for the rest of life together. I'll give you an example, and this is why I'm telling you, okay, since many of our pastors and leaders of churches, I think it's appropriate. See, I say to a lot of parents, uh, if your kids are in teenage years, especially when they are 13, 14, 15, get them hooked up with another older, okay, uncle, okay, a, a, a brother with a brother, a sister with a sister, all right? So get your son, for example, who is 13, 14, hook up with, okay, a man who is uh, 25, 26, 27, 28, all right? Okay, about 10 years or so uh, older. Don't hook up with a 60-year-old man. That's too old. Right? Because you'll find that when they're 13, 14, 15, 16 onwards, you'll find more and more, they want to move away from the parents and hang out with their peer group. But they actually don't mind hanging out with one or two uncles, okay, who are about 10 years older, who have a real desire and love for younger people and will spend time with them. And so we have seen this action in UMC, which I'm encouraging a lot of churches to do. All right? We have seen this, that many of the youth in UMC are hooked up with uh, 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 several of these men who are older, this younger youth, uh, male, older, okay? And today, these this young boys, for example, they are already married, have children. They still hang up with these so-called uncles, okay? And run to them time and again for whatever need, whatever problems. And because of the journey together, you find that these uh, people who have together become young men with young families have held on their faith and become continued to press on, be faithful to God. And now we are challenging, I'm challenging them. You now likewise do the same uh, with other young, younger ones. And so I thank God. We've got someone of just 23 years old. He's purposely, very smart guy, first class honors in law and everything, purposely spends time with 17 year, 18 year old. And he takes a cell group with 17 year old. He wants to journey with them together for as long as possible. So if we can all do that in our churches, friends, can I say, uh, the instead of falling off, it's so, so much less uh, than sometimes sadly what is happening today. So can I challenge you to do that? Because I do that as well, friends, can, can I tell you? Because I've got something like nine mentoring groups. One of my mentoring groups are all young looking adults, very smart, sharp, young looking adults. I take them on a journey with them. And I tell them, you do the same as well and take on younger people and do the same as well. Uh, but I tell them, you don't have to take as many as I take. So normally my mentoring groups, I've got about 12, okay? Uh, I don't call them discipleship groups, okay? I call them mentoring groups. And there's a difference between discipleship groups and mentoring groups, all right? Uh, and so I say, you don't have to take as many. You can take two, three, or four, whatever you're comfortable, and journey with them, uh, okay? And becomes a very powerful, in that sense, link every step of the way, okay? Uh, to, our, uh, to, our, uh, to our senior group. If we can all do that and uh, together we journey, I think the loss to our church and to the kingdom will be so much less than sometimes we leave it uh, on their own to try to wrestle out about uh, their, their journey of faith and their walk with the Lord. Okay, one last question. In order for our younger leaders to come out, 
come out, when would you advise the older leaders to retire or to let go? When is the right time and how do we know? Uh, well, for me, it's as soon as possible. You see, for us so-called older leaders, we should be cheerleaders, cheering the younger ones on. Very important. All right. And uh, uh, we older ones should not be uh, as you're dominating the scene for too long. Uh, we must learn. And, and, and so we must say, give opportunities for younger ones uh, to surface, to grow, uh, okay, in their faith, as well as in their giftings, whatever else, okay, like this. And this is also due to the security of the older leaders. Even for us as pastors, for example, you know, sometimes as pastors, we put a young fellow up to preach, 22, 24 years old, uh, there to preach. My goodness, he did a fantastic job. And everybody in church would say, well, pastor, that guy really preached well. But you know what? Sometimes as a, as a pastor, senior pastor, you feel threatened. My goodness, this young Chiku is doing better than me. I better not give him any more chance left. You know, which is so sad, you know. This is a reflection sometimes, you know, of our own insecurity. That we need to repent and ask God for forgiveness. That when we see really, okay, a diamond, maybe a very rough diamond, we should help to really polish it. Okay, and give the opportunities, okay, and, and, and platform to really begin to grow in that. And our job is to help them to move on to the next level, the next level, which is, I think, so important. So we ourselves, as leaders, got to be secure. Secondly, we got to be sensible to know what to do, how to stretch, okay, as much as possible. Thirdly, we got to be supportive as, as much as possible, all right? We got, every one of us got to have a timeline that we run by, so when it's time to pass on, we should pass on. But you see, I also see the older people. Uh, I remember preaching in this church in London, and this 74 year old man came up to me that I knew, I, 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 I knew before. And he said, You know, Pastor Dan, I think in your sermon you are, you are speaking to me, you're preaching to me. I said, No, I'm not preaching, I think God is speaking to you. He says, I'm 74 years old, I'm chairman of the church council. But at 31st of December, I plan to resign, hand over younger people. I wash my hands clean. That's it. I finished my task. Already. I said, Jim, I'm going to kill you if you do that. I said, you know, my goodness, you may be 74 years old, but you know, there's still many good years left in you, my friends. Okay. And there are four powerful things you've got in your life. What are they? Firstly, okay, uh, your whole area of your understanding of scripture, which is so important. Secondly, the gifts that God has given you that you hold over the years. Thirdly, what happens is that your, uh, your, 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 your maturity in the law. And fourthly, your experience that God has given to Ghana over the years. Hey, and this is my burden. Actually, sometimes I see some older people, they, they hand over leadership or hand over everything and then they end up by just coming to church every week and that's all they do. Which to me, I think is such a loss of the kingdom. Because you've got all these four, four wonderful things. Why you throw it away just like this? I said, you know what? All right, you may hand over younger people to lead, or to do whatever. Great, but run with them. All right, journey with them. Come alongside them, run with them. Encourage them and take them on and mentor them. Okay, spend time with them. All right, and, and if you do that, then you're using your gift and you're really imparting what God has given to you to them. Okay and do it all the rest of our lives, which is, I think, so important. Because otherwise, weekends, we come to church, it's all about all we do, what a waste of the kingdom of God. You know? And so, uh, can I urge all of us, at every level, if you do this, to the generation after the generation after, we find it to be so powerful in the overall work of God's kingdom. Well, thank you very much. That's all the time we have for questions during this part of the seminar. But don't worry, your chat, uh, is saved and if, and all the questions that are not answered will be given to Pastor Daniel for him to answer in his own good time. So now we uh, give back the time for Pastor Daniel to go on to his uh, uh, next session. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about the purpose now of spiritual leadership. Uh, all right. And this is unique, as I said, as always, uh, compared to that of the world outside. Okay. What is it? Firstly, is to bring in God's shalom to people and society. Okay. Uh, and so in Numbers 
chapter 6, verses 24 to 26, uh, that we are so familiar about uh, these Aaronic blessings. Let me read again. The Lord, uh, Aaron was asked by God to say this to the people of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes uh, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The word peace in Hebrew is the word shalom. And it's a great word, actually, a fantastic word. That sometimes in English, the word peace don't capture as well. But, you know, I believe many of us are well taught uh, in scripture. Uh, the word shalom uh, is not just the peace that we understand. It is actually wholeness. It is actually well-being. It is actually completeness in one's life and living. Okay, And that's what, uh, friends, you and I should be doing, really, in a responsibility uh, in giving leadership. All right, that uh, we must bring God's shalom, God's peace, God's wholeness, God's well-being uh, to people and society. Right? It is not just, uh, I believe it is not just to the people of God. It is not just meant for us only who are Christians. Right? We should be bringing God's shalom uh, to people and to society, to everybody around us. All right? And I think that's, it. that's important uh, for us as a spiritual leader. Because, you see, a spiritual leader does not only care for the people of God. A spiritual leader, if he's spiritual or she's spiritual, will care for everyone. Whether they're Christian or not, it does not matter. And is concerned about bringing God shalom to everybody like that. Okay. Uh, and so when we bring God shalom, it means that there is a real sense of unity and oneness amongst everybody. A real sense of belonging. A real sense of ownership. A real sense of participation. A real sense of that we're one big family together. And that's really my prayer uh, for all of us as spiritual leaders. That's what, friends, I say to CEOs of companies. You know what? Your responsibility the company is to build your company into a family. So that everybody in the company, Christian or not, does not matter at all. In fact, most of them were probably not Christian. All right? They must feel that they belong. They must feel this is a community they are part of. They must feel acceptance. All right? They must feel a real sense of ownership because that's what a family is all about. And I say to them, if you can build a company like this, an organization like this, you're in for a fantastic run in terms of leading your company. Okay. Uh, and, and so uh, that's uh, my burden and concern for all of us in our leadership. It doesn't have to be in church context. It could be in company context, organization context, it could be an NGO that you're involved in, in leading and running uh, to ensure that by the grace of God, you want to see God shallow coming upon everyone. Muslim, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Taoists, whoever they may be. I think that's important uh, for us. Uh, all right, that should be the goal that we decide at the, at the end of it all. Now, the second purpose for us is to lead people to encounter God personally. All right, it is not enough. Friends, for we ourselves who are Christians and other Christians to encounter God. We want as many people as possible to themselves encounter God as well. And that's how David puts it interesting in Psalm 42 in verse 4 about his own experience. David says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading a procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving amongst a festive throng. Of course, David here was talking in the context of he leading uh, uh, the Jewish people, all right, uh, the Israelites, okay, into the house of God in praise and in worship. But again, I want to extend this larger than that, all right, that our job responsibility as spiritual leader, all right, that you could be CEO of your company, so you can be a spiritual leader, and you want to see really as many of your staff encountering God himself, herself personally. And so you want to, you want to pray that God will use you Right, to be agent, uh, to just usher in the presence of God uh, in a situation like this. And therefore, for example, I say to them, pray for your staff regularly and pray that God will give you divine appointments and opportunities for you to engage with them at a personal level. Okay, and all of us need to do that. All right? uh, so if you are a, a staff in a company, you should be praying as well that your fellow colleague, workmate, will be able to you to encounter and experience God in a very special manner. Okay? And si simply through things like this, 
for a colleague of yours is sick in hospital, you should be the first to spring to action and go and visit a colleague in hospital. At the end of a visit, even the colleague may not be a Christian, could be a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Sikh, to say, uh, uh, my friend, you know I'm a Christian. Is it okay if I pray for you? Just make an offer. Uh, friends, can I say, there are many people who would love to be prayed for, uh, especially by Christians, honestly, and I want to say, especially Muslims. Right? They love to be prayed for by Christians because they know that when Christians pray, things happen. And just, just make an offer. If they say no, that's fine. You don't no, no need to be offended by it, but make an offer. You find it so many delighted uh, to do that. And sometimes when I go hospital visitation, I do that as well. Okay? I turn around other beds and, and look at them, and I want to connect with them through eye contact. If they do, I go up and say, Hi, what's your name? Or I talk a little bit, that kind of thing. And then I will introduce, I might do, by the way, I'm Daniel, who I'm a job of us. Uh, is it okay if I pray for you? And some of them were delighted uh, 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 for us to pray for them. And so you want to draw people in and prayerfully, by the grace of God, they will experience something of God and His presence, if not of His power at work. Okay, like this. I think uh, that's important. I'll give you an interesting story. Doris and I were up on a mountain for a holiday in Australia. And, uh, and we so happy to meet okay, this Jewish couple, brilliant couple, both lawyers, senior lawyers uh, in Melbourne. They were also up in the hill there for a holiday. Chatted tall and uh, of course introduced myself to him. Actually, I'm a, by the way, actually I'm a pastor. Talk, talk, talk. And I would try to quietly, gently witness to him. Everything I say, okay, he has got, okay, a response, a rebuttal, everything. I couldn't get through it all, okay? And then the, at the end of the second day, I said, okay, is it okay if I just pray for you? He said, okay. Uh, surprisingly, reluctantly, he agreed for me to pray for him. You know, I gently put my hand upon his hand to pray for him. Actually, what the power of God hit him. He started trembling and shaking like crazy. The moment I said, Amen, he dashed off back to his room. Friends, you know, I believe he will never, ever forget that experience at all in his life. Right? And so sometimes in a strange manner, we don't know why, I didn't even expect myself, okay? That God's grace and God's power just came and fell upon him, that encounter. And my prayer up to this day is that, Lord, somehow, I don't know how. All right, you touch his life, draw him to real faith in you, that he'll be such a wonderful testament witness. Uh, for you like this. And so that for in our place of work, we want to really pray and see how God will use us. All right? in those of us who are students, school, college, university, or teachers, or lecturers, school, college, university, that God uses us really uh, to bring His presence for people to encounter God. Now, a third area is to help others to dream big dreams for their lives and for God. You know, if they are Christians for God, but help others to dream dreams for their lives. Okay? And uh, that's uh, actually, a dream that God gave to me, if I may share this, Haggai chapter 2, verse 9, where God said uh, to his people uh, through prophet Haggai, uh, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of former house, says the Lord Almighty. And this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord. Uh, allow me, if you don't mind, to share uh, this from my own experience. You see, when I was a student in UK doing engineering, when I was uh, wrapping up to do my master's okay, in Birmingham, uh, I was also at that time heading up the Birmingham Chinese Christian Fellowship, which was really very much running like a church. Like I know I was chairman of that. So I was kind of a student pastor, okay, while I was wrapping up my, uh, my master's uh, in engineering. And then the Lord gave me this promise, actually, that, uh, that okay, you'll be involved in building a church whereby the glory of the present house will be greater than the glory of former house and this place you you and so god gave me the promise actually just before i left birmingham and on the last day i was standing there during a worship service in so-called jesus center in the, in the heart of birmingham that the, the service of packed food never have we seen so many people sunny uh, it dawned upon me i was absolutely awed and stunned by the presence of god that I saw the glory of this, this present house greater than the glory of former house. All right. And amazing things happened uh, that day. And then just before I return, God gave me the same promise. Haggai chapter 2 verse 9, it says, you watch out one day when involved in a church, you also experience the same as well, that the glory of the present house greater than the glory of former house. And uh, allow me to share if you don't mind, that at the 25th anniversary of UMC, 
uh, the UMC is, this is our 41st year. Uh, we've gone past 40 years now as, 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 as a church. But at the 25th anniversary, I still remember the Sunway Convention Center. There were 2,500 of us. And I said, you know what? I stand here in awe, in great thanksgiving. It's all God's work. It's not about me, not about us as leaders. It is really about God. That God is fulfilling this promise. That as I stand here, I see the glory of present house, greater than the glory of former house. And in this place, God says he will grant peace. That many encounter the peace of God. And so we have seen just wonderful ways in which God has broken through, touch hearts and lives and draw them to experience his peace, his love and joy and a great number of salvations and so forth like that. And so this is uh, the longing I think we should all have. Helping people, especially more so young people, to dream dreams for the Lord. Uh, what is it God wants to do with their lives? Okay, very important. So sometimes I tell young people, right, Okay, and you have no dreams, come to Dream Center, this place where we meet. All right, we help you to dream dreams. That's why this place is called Dream Center. And you can dream as many dreams as you want. You know why? Because dreams are free of charge. Amen. Isn't it? All right, and so therefore, we can help people to dream dreams honestly as to what is it that God has for us. Okay, so we look to God, ask God, Lord, show me, lead me, guide me like this. I think, which is uh, very important for us because why? Sometimes we don't dream at all, all right? And therefore, we live actually wasted lives. And that's my concern. And for us, okay, maybe a question I will ask, okay, you all listening in, uh, tuning in, is this, where is the greatest treasure that's to be found in this world? Okay, let me repeat. Where is the greatest treasures that are to be found in this world? It is, not, it is not in the diamond mines in South Africa or the oil fields in Saudi Arabia. The greatest treasures are found in the cemetery, the graveyard. Because there lies all the treasures okay, that are not mined at all. For example, the many books that ought to be written were not written, taken to the grave. There are many songs and poems and compositions and so many, many things okay, uh, that should have right, been uh, okay, written and composed and so, so forth. We, we're taken to the grave. You know? And so therefore, we all need to be challenged uh, in a fresh new way. Okay? That there's so much potential in each one of us. And let's dream together. Okay? And therefore, for uh, those of us, I think, uh, who are older ones, as I said, she journey with younger ones and help them to dream dreams, okay? Not just their own personal ambition, whatever, but under the law, seeking the face of God together, journey with them. What is it God wants to do with your life, okay? And how can you live it out in such a manner that at the end of it, when you look back one day, you could say like what Apostle Paul says, I fought a good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. What is in store for you is a crown of righteousness, okay? Right? That if we could do that, I think it is so fantastic, so great. You, you never know, right? You never know what it is. I think of my friend, okay, Ravi Zacharias, as we all know, just passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's just a case of one man coming into the hospital where he attended suicide, okay? One man just brought the Bible in and gave to the mother, and that verse was read to him that changed his life completely after that, even though at age 17, he was trying to take his life and see what a phenomenal impact he has made right, in the some 50 years of ministry uh, around the world. So you never know what can happen. And that's why I want to encourage many, many of you, take on a younger person, journey with them, okay, and help them along and give them wings to fly, give them dreams to begin to dream uh, from God and uh, give them platform opportunities for them to expose themselves and for them to be able to uh, begin to draw in whatever and help them in uh, their learning, their understanding, coming to grasp scriptures and so how we live and apply in their lives. I hold them accountable, responsible as well as they run with them, journey with them. I believe you know, many of us have the joy, the blessing, and privilege of seeing some of these people who we journey with. They're flying extremely well for the Lord, for which we should give praise, thanks uh, to God, uh, and very, very important uh, for us. And so, helping people to do that. Then, number four. It is to be important catalyst to advance God's kingdom. Right. The spiritual leader is always concerned about how God's kingdom can advance. 
and that we should be a catalyst in this regard. And so Matthew 13, verse 33, uh, Jesus told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman, take, a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. See, now this yeast is used in a, 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 a different context from the yeast that we normally under the yeast of the fairy seeds, the hypocrisy of the fact yeast is okay, different, right? A small amount of yeast mixed into the dough, we find it, it changes the whole, okay? Uh, mixed with the flour, it changes, it becomes a, a wonderful loaf of bread, okay? Like, like this. And it's a small little amount can catalyze, can transform and change uh, the whole thing. And we are actually, in a sense, like yeast like this, okay, to catalyze and to really cause an advance in God's kingdom, wherever God has put us in. And so that's my constant prayer, really, you know, for those of us out in the marketplace, for example, in our place of work, all right, are we catalyzing? Are we like a catalyst to inspire people to move closer to God uh, uh, and, and to see a much more, a Christian environment taking place in our place of responsibilities. Okay, do our presence does my presence uh, cause people to move towards closer to, to God or push people away from God, which be a real real tragedy. Right? Does my presence contribute towards kingdom advance? We must constantly check ourselves and challenge ourselves in this regard. Okay, likewise in our neighborhood, does my presence uh, make a difference? Uh, there, okay. Uh, in school, college, university as well. Okay, does my presence make a difference? Uh, because if not, then we're failing in our responsibility as a catalyst, really, uh, for the kingdom of God. And so, spiritually, leader, God have these things uh, uh, constantly in mind. One last thing let me mention here uh, is to be a powerful agent for transformation society. Okay, uh, and so this is what Jesus says to us in. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13, 16, that we are so familiar. Allow me to read again. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamb and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let like the light shine before men. Let me see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, because the two metaphors we are so familiar with, uh, okay, salt of the earth and light of the world. So we are all salt and light. Okay. And we are the ones who are to be involved in a transformational society. Okay. And you and I know, friends, for example, salt is only useful in a place that needs it, <clears throat> not in a place that doesn't need it. So, and so sometimes this is my concern, if not really worry and burden. Because sometimes we Christians, we tend to hang around very much by ourselves. If we hang around just by ourselves as Christians, nothing wrong with that. But you know what? If we are salt to the earth, then we are salting one another. Okay? And if we keep on salting one another, we are all end up becoming over salted hamgi, over salted salt fish. And over salted salt fish won't taste very nice, isn't it? All right. But friends, you know, no, salt is meant to be in a place where it needs it, not in a place that doesn't need it, like, okay, in the body of Christ. And so therefore, our job response is to be out there to mix with people of all manner and form and to begin to salt, okay, lives of people and situations and so and so forth. And as light of the world, we are, to, okay, to bring light, okay, uh, understanding, actually. Right. And so we've got to guard ourselves the fact sometimes say, my goodness, everything is so wrong in society. The evil is, is, is growing, okay, the riots and demonstration, everything is everything has gone wrong, so, so forth like that. Okay, what is wrong? And sometimes there's a tendency, if you're not careful, uh, to curse the darkness and say, well, I said, no, no, we don't do that. Don't curse the darkness, introduce a light, is it? And that's what it is. And this is why John Stott has this brilliant statement. Uh, he says this. The church where it exists in a community, if the community where the church exists falls apart, John Stott says, who is supposed to be blamed? Who is responsible? And his answer, spot on, the church is to be blamed. If the community where the church exists falls apart, the church is to be blamed, rightly. And John Stott says, why? Because we're the salt of the earth and light of the world. 
isn't. You don't expect society outside that is fallen to become better. It will never be. It is we who must, must make the difference. So if the community where the church exists falls apart, the church should be blamed, and rightly so. And we do repent and confess. And so therefore, the point is this, we all need to get out, be engaged, be involved with whatever social, ethnic, religious groups, okay? Be bridge builders, uh, be people who bring flavor and civil into there and stop the rot, okay, and the wrong that is there. And by the grace of God, to bring, bring change and understanding and transformation uh, uh, in, in the process. Now, allow me to apply this uh, for all of you, because oftentimes that's a question that's been asked. How can we change a country? Look at what has gone wrong. Okay. Uh, can't you see? Everything is so clear. All right. It's getting worse and worse. Um, so, okay. what is the answer? Is there any hope, really? Uh, what are we supposed to do? And what you all, Christian leaders, what are you all church leaders going to do about it? Um, and many times when we say that, we say with a sense of uh, helplessness, hopelessness, and real despair. I'd say if you ask that question about, you know, all right, the, all the things around society, what can we do? Okay. Uh, all right. It is a misunderstanding actually about ourselves. Uh, like J.K. Chesterton, as you know, all right, uh, somebody wrote a long complaint about what is wrong in society. And J.K. Chesterton responded okay, to the editorial there in the Times many years ago, of course, now. He says, Dear Mr. Editor, I am your sincerely J.K. Chesterton. That's all. He said, We complain about all that is wrong in society. Who, okay, who is responsible? J.K. suggests two words I am. I am responsible for all that is wrong in society. In other words, and he's absolutely right, that we ourselves have not been salt and light. And that's why society has gone wrong. So answer lies with us, never with them. Okay, and very, very important uh, uh, for it. Okay, that we got to start with ourselves first. Never look to anyone for answers, for help, for hope. The answers actually lie with us. The church is the hope of the world. And if the church don't live up what is meant to be offering hope to the world, then where is there hope left uh, in society, in a country, in a world for that matter? So, so answer lies with us. And it starts with, very simply, with each one of us ourselves. Have we been sought and light where we are simply? If we have not been, we need to repent, ask for forgiveness, and ask God to help you start all over again. I said, okay, and I've asked this, maybe in some of the churches I've preached in, I, I've said this, so given a chance to start a church all over again, I said, I'm, I'm going to start a church like this. In the first year, I reach out to one person, lead that person to faith in Christ, I will disciple that person nicely and properly. Next year, the two of us go out. Each one of us lead one to faith in Christ. Now it becomes four of us. I will disciple all three properly and nicely. Then the following year, four of us go out. Each one of us lead one to faith in Christ. Now eight of us, I disciple all seven. And so if we do this simple math like this, first year two, second year four, third year eight, then 16, then 32, then 64, how many years will it take to win a world of 7.5 billion people to the Lord and see their lives totally transformed uh, to the glory of God? How many years will it take? Uh, friends, and I preached and asked this question around the world. In fact, uh, in a church in China, in Sunjin, China, I preached in. Within 20 seconds, this young Chinese guy put up his hand and said to me, Pastor Daniel, you know what? When you hit 30 years, you have touched 1 billion people. 31 years, 2 billion. 32 years, 4 billion. 33 years, you are home. You have touched 8 billion people. All right. And I said, young man, smart guy, spot on. Absolutely right, indeed. You see, friends, even starting with yourself, as starting with you yourself, in 33 years, you can actually change the whole world. And that's why, although Jesus says to us, we all know Matthew chapter 9, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers, the laborers are few. But he also says in John chapter 4, right, in verse 35, Jesus says, do not say four months more and then the harvest. Open your eyes, look at the fields. It is ripe for harvest. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, the harvest is plentiful, 
he says in John chapter 4, the harvest is ripe. And Jesus says it's 2,000 years ago. And yet 2,000 years later, we are far, far from finishing the job. And that's why, friends, you know, one day when we see Jesus, honestly speaking, you and I, including myself, got lots to repent before the Lord. Why? Because we have not been fulfilling what we ought to be doing. When the harvest is plentiful and the harvest is ripe. Okay. And so honestly speaking, you know, you and I need to play that role of just quietly reaching out, okay, praying first for these people around us, building bridges, making friendship relationship, and then thirdly, pray that God will use you to turn your ordinary conversations into spiritual conversations. So faith comes up naturally, not artificial naturally. And then after you share Jesus and pray that God will use you to lead a person faithfully because we, you and I know we can all testify how to transform society. It starts with we ourselves, isn't it? We know that we are transformed because of the gospel of Christ, isn't it? Because of the gospel of Christ, we are transformed. Okay, And transformed people will be the best people to help to transform society. Right? And so therefore, the answer is with us. So what is wrong society? It is wrong with us. We have not been playing our part and our role like this. Okay, And so that's why, you know, as a spiritual leader, right, you and I must know we are really an amazing and most powerful agent for the transform of society. And I pray by God's grace, really, let's do it. Never too late. Okay, And in no time, I believe, we're going to change and transform a nation. Now, I've got some questions here. All right, for you all, okay, uh, we can pick it up, talk about it after this, but let me just uh, mention this. In what ways have we exercised a measure of spiritual leadership where you are? How has that made a difference to the lives of people around you and to the kingdom of God? And then another one, second one is maybe in your own time uh, with your loved ones, with your church people, with your friends, whoever, pair up and share with someone about this and then pray for each other for greater influence, impact. Uh, in your place of work responsibilities, wherever you are. Is it okay? Right, let me move on to the last bit. Okay. All right, I may have time to finish that. I'll pick it up tomorrow night if I don't have. But I uh, want to take another about 12, 13 minutes to talk because I want to give some time for interaction because I know it's hard to be listening uh, for too long. So I normally I try to keep uh, my teaching time to about 40, 45 minutes at most. Okay, so allow me about 10 minutes or so and then after that, we go into a time of interaction. Now, we talk about the nature of spiritual leadership. We talk about the whole area of the purpose of spiritual leadership, that it must make a difference in the kingdom of God, okay, at the end, wherever we are. Finally, the practices of spiritual leadership, okay. All right. How do we ourselves practice uh, leadership as a spiritual person, man or lady, right? Firstly, all right, we must show godliness and humility in our life okay that's one of the important marks as we okay live out our spiritual leadership and so yeah uh, you notice uh, paul writes like this in acts chapter 20 and in verse 19 i serve the lord with great humility and with tears although i severely tested by the plots of the jews see paul in spite of all the pressures and all okay uh the, the weight upon him paul says i continue to serve god with great humility and tears and that's an important mark of a spiritual leader. On one hand, real spirituality in terms of godliness, but on the other, humility. Okay. And it's something that uh, could actually be seen and experienced by people. See, a humble person is a very personable person. And this humble person connects with everybody. Doesn't put himself ab herself above other people. Comes, comes down to whoever and connect with people like that but this humble person is teachable and that's why this quality is so much talked about in scripture all right and that's why in two passages of scripture both in one peter as well as the book of james right, it tells us god opposes a proud but gives grace to the humble and so when there's humility we find it draws the grace of god in the one and i like what actually mother Teresa uh, says in one of her quotes she says this if you are humble nothing can touch you Neither praise nor disgrace, because you know what you are. Okay, let me repeat. If you're humble, nothing can touch you. Neither praise nor disgrace, because you know what you are. See, she did not say, because you know who you, who you are. 
but because you know what you are. What are we? All of us are people with feet of clay. We are all very ordinary people. That if we all do well and, uh, and, and become so-called as the world famous, it is all because of the grace of God, not because of us. It is because of God's mercy, His grace and goodness. Okay? And so that, friends, you know, all right, if we are praised, we will not become solemn hated because we are very ordinary people who have been raised up by God. Right? As I say, people who feel okay. And so if you are praised, all right, praise will not destroy us. Okay? Uh, because this is just a grace of God if we are. But only if you are disgraced, it will not crush us because we are just ordinary people as well. So whether praise or disgrace, it should not affect us whatsoever if we are a humble person. And I think Mother Teresa reflects that so well, really, in her life. Um, there's so much grace and humility uh, in her like this, isn't it? All right? Anyone, if you ask anyone, Christian, non-Christian, who do you think will be a global icon of humility? I think most people will say Mother Teresa, is it? And so it's important for us as spiritual leaders, showing godliness, real spirituality on one hand, on the other hand, humility is important. Okay. Secondly, shows grace and generosity. And so 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, where Peter writes, Do not repay evil with evil, insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. Okay. And so when people are unkind, unjust, you should maintain a big heart. It's okay. Forgive them. Move on in your life. Okay? And don't be so offended or upset that you will find an opportunity to try to hit back at them. It's okay. You just move on in your life. And this is a fantastic mark of a really wonderful spiritual leader. On one hand, extending grace to people, but also generosity. Generosity, not only in terms of uh, resources you give to them, you offer them, you bless them, but also generosity of heart and mind. When people, when, when you're offended, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Let's move on. All right, we've got bigger things to be concerned. We've got really bigger issues to deal with rather than concern about uh, my hurt and my wounds, that kind of thing. And so spiritual leaders will reflect that really, which is so important because sometimes as spiritual leaders, if we harbor wounds and hurts, we are crippled. And that's why sometimes some spiritual leaders cannot scale the height that God has designed for them because right, there's so much wounds in a person's life that a person harbors. Now, we will always be hurt. That's how we are. Nobody runs away, no matter how spiritual we are. But the thing is, deal with it and move on in life because we've got, we've got big up and more important battles to fight. Uh, very important for us. Then, a third area is that uh, he bears the fruit or she bears the fruit of the Holy Spirit increasingly. Okay, uh, that's a very important all right, uh, practice uh, in terms of a spiritual person. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. See, when we bear fruit of the Holy Spirit, all these nine facets of that one fruit of the Spirit comes out, uh, comes out in our lives. Okay, and uh, that's what it is. As I said last night, about a person who is full of the Holy Spirit, because if you're full to the full of the Holy Spirit, what comes out is the fruit of the Spirit. You see, and so therefore, is there. Uh, patience, kindness, and goodness in you. See, when people uh, shake you, people knock into you, will all this come out in your life? Or will anger, bitterness come out? See, because if anger, bitterness, hatred, resentment comes out, then we're not bearing uh, the fruit of the Spirit as uh, Scripture tells us like this. And so a spiritual leader uh, will increasingly show greater joy and peace and love. Okay? And, and that's so, so important. Because sometimes I'm concerned uh, there are some uh, Christian and senior Christians I meet. Sometimes I find there's not a lot of joy in the person's life. The older he gets, the less joy. It appears to me like that person is baptized in lemon juice. Okay? So sour. <laughs> okay, in so many regards. It's, which is so sad. You know what I mean? Because some people can end up, okay, after many years as a Christian, a uh, very angry, bitter person. I mean, so sad. There's no more joy left. What for? Have we missed the, the point of being a Christian? It's an older we get, the more joyful 
more grateful, more thankful you should be, rather become more uptight, more angry, more upset. And it, it's so sad. We, we miss it altogether. So instead of growing old gracefully, uh, uh, we are growing. We are growing old okay, uh, unhappily and un ungracefully. Honestly speaking, isn't it? And so, uh, bearing fruit of the spirit uh, is important uh, for us. Then, fourthly, a spiritual leader is kingdom-minded and shows kingdom concern. Okay, so always think about the kingdom of God, which is what it should be all about, and also a real kingdom concern. Okay. And so that's how Paul writes uh, to us, which is so good, I think, uh, for us to grasp about what Paul says that motivates him in his life. Paul writes 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. Though I'm free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this, so I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share, that I may share in its blessings. See, look at the amazing mind of Apostle Paul. Totally preoccupied with about the kingdom and the things of the kingdom. Okay, how uh, kingdom concerned he is about whatever he will do. Uh, as long as he can extend God's kingdom without, of course, compromising his own values and his own standards. He will do it, okay, like that. And I think that's what should capture our heart and our mind, really, as spiritual leaders. Deeply concerned about the impact on the kingdom. That, for example, uh, an earlier question was asked, can a political leader be a spiritual leader? Of course, if they're Christian and, and seeks to honor God and live by God's values and standards. But you see, a political leader who's a spiritual leader also must keep in mind, okay, about the kingdom of God and must hold the kingdom concerned that whatever he says or she says, okay, if it is going to, for example, affect the witness of that person in the kingdom, then I think it'll be very sad, isn't it? And so therefore, we got to keep that in mind constantly. And this is where, uh, honestly speaking, I tend to fellowship with pastors. Uh, and they want to fellowship pastors. They've got kingdom concern. Right? The thing bigger than their own local church. I love to fellowship with people like this. Okay? Not thinking about my own local church, but there's nothing wrong with it. Thinking we should be concerned about our own local church. But okay, these people have got greater heart, a heart for the kingdom of God and not just my own local church. And for people that I love to sh spend time with, share fellowship in, uh, and just enjoy one another like that. Okay. And, and so uh, we, we got to draw in people of that kind of concern so that we can together be kingdom-minded and, and see in what way we, we can advance God's kingdom in a greater manner. And so I can share with you this honestly. I've got a group, what I call a peer mentoring group. These are all uh, senior pastors or former senior pastors who in their 60s, Okay, and in the 70s, right? I meet them uh, once every six weeks here at Dream Center. Okay, but now, of course, not able to meet. We still meet uh, on, on Zoom. And we meet over lunch. Okay, we talk and that kind of thing. And every time we meet, we've done such good friends for so many years now. Right? We meet to uh, all right, come together. We meet to let our hair down. Although not much hair to let down nowadays. Okay, uh, but we meet to do four things really. All right, which is important. I trust I share this. You may think about it yourself. Uh, having a group like this, okay, for uh, for your own good as well. I trust. Okay, what is it? Firstly, this is a okay. This is a group. This is a circle of friendship, circle of friends, a network of friends. So we all need to be friends and real friends of one another. Okay, because God forbid, as we age, as we grow old in our ministry, that one day after fifty years of ministry, for example, we sit back to relax to young child to have tea. Nobody to drink tea with because we we'll never make time for friendship. Okay, I say, God forbid that would happen to us. So this is a circle, a network of friends. Secondly, this is a network of mutual support and encouragement. I mean, who doesn't need Every one of us, okay, needs that. Is the support and encouragement because why? We know many times it's lonely at the top. But thirdly, this is a network of accountability to hold one another accountable. I said, 
so that we know if we hold an account with the chances of finishing so much better than if we turn around and run the race on our own. Fourth and finally, this is a network of partnership to see what we can do together to advance God's kingdom in a greater manner and not just my own local church. Okay. And so therefore, we need to draw such people in together so that together we pray by God's grace. We will really you know, make a huge impact uh, in the kingdom of God because we carry kingdom with concern and that we are kingdom minded. Okay, let me stop here. Uh, I'll carry on. I'll finish that, the rest of it tomorrow and, 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 the, and the last bit. Okay. All right. Let's uh, have a time of interaction together. I think I've spoken enough. I think, okay, you've been hearing enough, long enough. I think there's enough of that. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Pastor Daniel, for inspiring us and challenging us, you know, uh, in terms of uh, what we can do okay, to lead and to exercise leadership. So in light of that, uh, there are some churches where the clergy does all the, lead, the leadership, uh, all the ministry, and in some churches, all the lay people does all the, 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 the ministry. What do you think is the right balance? How, does, how do the lay people work with clergy? Okay. All right. Uh, see, the clergy's job, the clergy's job is to equip people for ministry. See, our job as leaders or pastors is to equip people for ministry. And that's how Apostle Paul puts it actually in Ephesians chapter 4. All right? There are many, many gifts that God has given to the body of Christ. And these gifts are given to us so that we may equip people for the work of ministry. So it gives us apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. These gifts are given to us so that together we may equip God's people for ministry. So therefore, ministry should not just be done by the clergy or by, uh, by the pastors or so-called the professionals. Right? Ministry should be done by every one of us. So the job of the leadership of the church is to equip everyone so that together we may be able to be effective in serving the Lord, which is very, very important for us. Because sometimes, sadly, the leaders of the church, uh, take over everything, run everything. All right? Well, no, our, the, the job should, our job is to keep on equipping people, keep on raising people, give them opportunities, platforms, and train them to do all that is needed so that they can evolve and participate in together building the body of Christ. So therefore, important, okay, important statement is, I, I've said this in training conferences in the past, everyone a minister. The minister is not just so-called the professional clergy. Every one of us is a minister. All of us got a role and a part to play right, in the work of the church, in the work of God's kingdom. Right? So the job of the leaders is equipping others uh, together. Let's do the work. <clears throat> Would you describe that uh, as a mentor-mentee relationship or what's the difference between a mentoring group and a disciple? Discipleship group. Oh, wow. You're, you're pushing me hard on that. Okay. Uh, I do make a difference myself, although people may see it a little bit differently. Uh, because as, as I said, I've got nine mentoring groups running at the same time. Uh, three business leaders groups, maybe our CEOs of companies and so on and so forth. Uh, another group of senior pastors of churches from different denominations in this, uh, in a clan valley. I meet with one of the ancient would fly out from JB. Uh, right, to come as a senior pastor from the leading a wonderful church to come and join me. And there go younger pastors I meet with, then people in the entertainment industry, music entertainment industry, uh, that I journey with them. These are top notch professional musicians, entertainers in this country, they're well known, their names I wouldn't mention. And then people in the sports world, all right, uh, people who play games from Malaysia in football, in, in badminton, in, in, in golf as well, that I journey with them. Then also, there's a group of politicians I journey with as well. And some of these are well-known names likewise in this country. And so you another group of young working adults. So I journey with them, okay? I call these mentoring groups and not discipleship groups. Why? Because discipleship groups, very much like Jesus' 12 disciples, discipleship groups are close-ended. No new people can join, okay? No, I don't want that. I want to have a slight liberty to bring one or two or a few more new people in as and when needed, okay? 
uh, but in discipleship is close ended, no new people can show so like Jesus talk. Okay, like that. Okay, I, I don't want that. Secondly, in the case of discipleship group, it is very, very close, close up. It's very, very okay, uh, tight with one another. What happens? They must meet at least once a week. All right? Because if you don't meet once a week, it is not really quite a discipleship group. So therefore, it's it's not really very tight, it's very close up with one another. Thirdly, what happens in the case of a discipleship group? There's a discipler and the disciples. In us, it is very much a teacher-pupil relationship. I'm the guru, I'm the rabbi. The rest of you, you are learners, you are students. And I don't that. Okay, I said there are things I can learn from you all, even some of the younger ones. Okay, I want to interact and share uh, one of my mentoring groups, for example. Uh, two, two young ones I brought in to join young working adults. They're both 22 years old, but they're smart and sharp and outstanding. Okay, uh, like, and I, there are things we can learn from them. So in the case of discipleship group, it is very much a teacher-pupil relationship. But in the case of mentoring group, okay, it is one whereby I can learn from you as well, not just for me to impart, for me to learn and, and, and glean from you okay, in the process. Then another area is that uh, in the case of the mentoring group, I expect all these people, these mentories, to do work and good work and, and, and homework and hard work, right? Because the more work you do when we come together to interact, the more we learn together. The less work you do, the less we learn together. So if I put the onus on, okay, uh, these mentories, all right? Unlike a discipleship group, the onus is placed upon the guru, the rabbi, the teacher to teach everything and people just to absorb to take in whatever. No, I, I don't want to see that as well. I want to throw the response onto the mentors and say that you've got to play your part, play your role, do all the readings I tell you to do, and we'll come together. We can talk about, not just on the subject uh, there, we can talk anything under the sun, okay? From politics, potatoes, or whatever else we talk about, like our own personal life, family, and everything. We open it up and talk about it. Like that. Uh, so these are just some of the things, okay, uh, about this hypothesis mentoring. Someone mentioned that uh, in some churches, there are no pastors, and so the shepherding work is done by lay people who are also deeply involved in the corporate world. So they have their, their work, their professional careers, their families. So how do, you, how do they adequately mentor, uh, equip, lead in a context like this? Yeah. I think as long as we all adopt a learning portion in life, uh, as long as we all adopt a learning portion in life, we can all begin to, to grow deeper, uh, to grow stronger, uh, okay? And that in the process, we'll be able to help other people in the journey as well. You see, it is not when we are well equipped now, I'm ready for leadership because I'm really equipped now, I'm mature, I'm steady, I know the scriptures really well. Okay, now come, come, come and come and join me. No, no. I think it's a it's a journey. All of us along that journey. Some of us may be further down the road, okay, but we are all in the same journey together. So every one of us along the journey can pick up someone that's just behind us. If we all do this, then we find everybody is connected in the process. Uh, in fact, early on, before this session started uh, tonight, actually, uh, telling Pastor Tony, what happens is I believe in the coming days, I believe increasing by vocational pastors. Okay. Uh, and in DMC, we've got quite a number. I've appointed quite a number. During my time as senior pastor, I appointed eight of them as by vocational pastors. They still hold their jobs, full time jobs, and they're all in very senior positions, one or two CEOs of companies. Okay. And appoint them as well and give them the title pastor. All right. These are people who have been church for many, many years, proven themselves by their lives, their family, okay, as well as their gifts and their ministry, and the real heart and burden and commitment to, 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 to the Lord and to the work of the church. Yeah, bring them in. And some of these are more than willing to come in. Okay? And the best part of this, they're willing to serve, and they've proven themselves over years, arose as cell leaders, zone leaders, and so on and so forth like that. Uh, they've really proven themselves to the gifts, the ministry, and everything else, and a wonderful family life, and, and, and doing well in the workplace and everything. Right? Okay, challenge them to come on board, to say, take on the role of a pastor. Okay? And uh, I call these as NSPs, non-salaried pastors. In other words, they're not paid. Okay? But they're, they're happy to serve, and more than happy to serve. Okay, there's an emergency, 
all right, under uh, in the particular zone under his responsibility, we step in to help to cover those of us, so-called quote unquote full time. We step in to cover, step in to cover those uh, when he or she is not able to. But well, otherwise, why not? You know, some of these NSP so-called in DMC, they're some of the most outstanding uh, servants of Lord that we know who are doing phenomenally well on one hand in ministry, on the other hand out there in the marketplace. So it can be done. Uh, okay. I would say if friends stretches people, you know what? Uh, that's a motto I have, right? People will not die from overwork. People will die from underwork. Huh? Amen. Really? Uh, all right. Uh, okay, I, I learned this from a great uh, man of God and the doctor, Safi Afia. Okay, maybe uh, don't only might know him. Great man of God. Uh, Safi is now close to 90 years old. Uh, okay, I was an outstanding Christian leader okay, in, in, in this world, uh, really. Years ago, uh, when I was general secretary at NECF and also leading DUMC at the same time, actually, all right, so I was actually over time, okay, leading DUMC, uh, pastor DUMC, as well as general secretary at NECF. He called me up one day and said, Daniel, you know, uh, I'd like you to write a chapter on the church in Malaysia because I'm going to edit a book called, okay, Church in Asia, Opportunities and Challenges. And this book is actually available. Okay, it's, uh, it's uh, okay. And, 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 and I said to him, okay, uh, Dr. Arthur, you know, I'm so busy, you know. I go, he said, you know what he said to me? That's the kind of man I'm looking for. That's the kind of person I'm looking for. I'm not interested about people who are not busy. I'm interested about people who are busy. And people who are busy can be pushed and pushed hard. And I learned from him, really. Of course, I burned both ends of the candles, and I'm so glad I wrote it, actually. Uh, chapter is The Church in Malaysia. Uh, okay, uh, I wrote it. In fact, John Roxburgh, some of you might know, a wonderful church historian. Uh, and John Roxburgh himself came up to and tell me, you know, the chapter you wrote is so well written. So, so good, actually. And so I'm so glad I've been pushed to do this. And because... Okay, he pushed me. So I learned, right? Overwork, uh, work hard. Overwork will not kill a person. No work will kill a person. Okay, so uh, those of you who are listening, my friends, okay, if you're out there doing well in a corporate world, could you just take on as extra responsibility in church and avail yourself, uh, maybe as a bivocational pastor? And then in a the process, equip like going for evening class, like for example, classes like this right now we're having. Okay, that's how we equip ourselves. And so I call this as uh, training on the run, okay? As we are running, we have been, been trained, okay? So this is called training on the run as we go along. And it's possible. And honestly, that's how I actually did my doctoral work. Uh, my doctoral work, actually, uh, I was a senior pastor, full-time, everything like this. Okay, six weeks a year, over four years, I flew over uh, to Asbury Theological and to finish on my doctoral work, okay? And, and I did everything while still leading the church. Right? So it's possible, it can be done. Uh, one final question for tonight. After hearing you and you putting us, giving us so many ideas and we're raring to go, and then we go to our church and the leadership says, hold on, or not interested, and they don't want to change. So, so how can we be catalyst mm. in a situation like this? Oh, I thought your church is already, all your church are ready to fly already. You cannot wait to. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. Well, if that is so, okay, if that is so, I pray it is not a case, but if that is so, I will say firstly, pray. Well, everything starts with prayer. Firstly, pray for your church. Pray for your leaders. Okay. Pray for yourself. Uh, uh, that kind of thing. That's so, so important for God to just continue to speak and work in the hearts and lives of every one of us. Secondly, be patient. All right. Don't expect to change things overnight. All right, very important. Just be patient. Uh, wait upon the Lord for God's timing uh, for you. Okay, thirdly, work with one or two people who are open to you and open uh, for change and open to see good things coming upon the church. I mean, not trying to create division whatsoever. You know what I mean? Because people you work with, you've got to make sure their hearts. Their hearts must be good. Very important. If you're out to try to prove that we are right and they are wrong. I think this is the wrong spirit. We should never have that kind of spirit that we know better, we are right, all of you, church leaders, you're all wrong. We should never have that, okay? And so therefore, as I said, firstly, pray. Secondly, be patient. Thirdly, work with those who have got the right heart. A heart for the Lord, a heart for God's kingdom, a desire to see 
greater oneness and unity in the work of God and words of God's kingdom. Slowly, slowly journey with them together and learn and share and pray together. Okay. And slowly, slowly praying by God's grace that you may be able to influence one by one, slowly, one at a time, one at a time as you go along. And as you do that, I believe slowly, slowly over time, when people see your heart, when the leaders will see your heart, that you are genuinely interested, all right, in wanting to see good coming upon the church, genuine to see renewal coming upon the church. I believe, you know, slowly over time, when you prove yourself like this, uh, I believe they'll come alongside with you and say, yeah, come along, okay, let's, let's work at it together. And actually, I've seen this happening. I've actually seen this happening in, ch in some churches here in Malaysia, which I really rejoice and celebrate and today. I have the joy of going back to them to preach, okay, and seeing the grace of God at work like this. So pray, secondly, be patient. Thirdly, work with one or two or three, whatever people who are open uh, to want to see change, who has got a right heart, not a heart of division, not a heart that is proud that we know better than all of you. Know. That is uh, open, transparent, teachable, willing to be corrected, okay? Uh, a humble heart and a teachable spirit, and together learn and grow and journey together. Because then, oh, and continue to remain falsely, remain faithfully serving. Always be positive and serve and serve and serve. Because if you do that over time, people will see your heart, people will see the posture, okay, of your life. And I think slowly you find that you'll be more than willing. Because in a, as you pray hard, God, I believe, will slowly, slowly affirm you. Well, thank you very much. I think. Tomorrow's session will be even better. Okay, we, we need to close here. So, uh, thank you everybody. We'll see you again tomorrow. God bless. Mm.